Hey, what is up guys, MKBHD here, and this is the OnePlus 5. And, and just like every smartphone in the past three years, there's been leaks, there's been rumors, there's been renders, there's been speculation, but now it's real, it's here in the flesh, and this is everything you need to know. So OnePlus's history is actually pretty limited and they're a young, small company. And because they're a small company, they actually don't have the access to all this super high-end tech that the Apples and Samsungs and Motorola's and HTC's of the world do. That's a disadvantage. But the advantage to being a small company is you can actually listen to what your core fan base and what your core customers actually want and try to give them that exact product. So OnePlus 5 is another incremental improvement over OnePlus 3T with a few big bullet point changes and a couple minor touch-ups. So first thing you'll notice is the insane specs. You can tell it's an enthusiast brand here. Snapdragon 835, Adreno 540, six or eight gigabytes of RAM, and 64 or 128 gigabytes of storage. A dual camera system on the back, 16 and 20 megapixel cameras, Bluetooth 5.0, a 3300 milliamp hour battery, and a 5.5 inch 1080p AMOLED display, and of course an updated unibody metal design. Okay, so not bad. Let's break it all down. The all new design is what's turning heads this time. You saw the renders, and then you saw all the replies. You probably saw all the YouTube comments. Oh, from the back, it looks like an iPhone. They're copying Apple. They've become a copycat company. Honestly, I only agree with some of this. I mean, obviously the renders, when we saw them from that one angle, it obviously looks like an iPhone because it's got the dual camera system up in the top left corner. Okay, I get that. But honestly, if you look at the whole entire body of the phone, it does resemble some other phones even more so than this one. Seriously, how are these not the same phone? Plus, they've kept a lot of the design cues from previous OnePlus phones, from the 3 and the 3T, with you know the alert slider, of course, and the ports on the bottom in USB Type-C. It's kind of like a Frankenstein smartphone design pulling parts from a bunch of different places. But then again, how much do you actually look at the back of your phone? I mean, honestly, it actually has to feel good more than it has to look good. And this one does, it's seven and a half millimeters thin. It's got all these rounded sides. It's all metal, but you don't have to look at it as much as you have to feel it. And the OnePlus 5 is a good feeling phone. They kept that alert slider, which I like and always got used to pretty quickly. And of course they kept the fingerprint reader up at the front, the same like last year and the year before, same size, same position. Also the design is kind of limited because the only colors you can actually get this phone in are literally black and almost black, which I love matte black, that's great, but obviously if you want some variety, you can grab a skin. I'll link to these below, it's a dbrand skin, and that's easily my favorite way to add color to it without adding the bulk of a case. I highly recommend them. So this does mean you're not getting the big bezel-less displays that a lot of phones have been moving to this year, and that we expected of the new iPhone and the new Pixel, etc. We still have some pretty thin side bezels here, but it's definitely not quite the same effect. I actually found it interesting that in the Verge's exclusive video of like the making of this phone that they dropped, yesterday, they actually admitted like they would have liked to have done something like an infinity display or a bezel-less screen, but they just don't have the tech to do it. That's another disadvantage of being a small company. Now the dual camera system on the back, before we even get to photo quality, is already pretty interesting. First of all, it's, it's the headlining new feature. It's on the box, right, twice, so it's clearly what they want you to focus on, no pun intended. But it is a 16 megapixel f1.7 primary camera with electronic image stabilization and then a 20 megapixel f2.6 telephoto camera as a secondary. On paper, that looks pretty good. And then when you open up the new camera app, you'll notice it is a blatant copy of the iPhone camera app. No doubt about that. The 1x to 2x button for switching between the lenses is there. Settings in the strip on the left, shutter button on the right. It's pretty basic. And then the slider, of course, between the 1x and the 2x when zooming in. It's definitely a copy here. No one can really deny that. Here's the thing. I've always said, I don't really mind if you copy stuff, but if you're going to copy something, copy the good stuff. So if you're gonna copy the iPhone, one of the best and most popular phones out there, then yeah, sure, copy the camera, copy the fingerprint reader, don't copy the bad stuff, don't copy like Siri or something. Bixby. So this 1x to 2x button and the slider and everything in the camera, it's kind of the best way to do it. So I don't mind that being a copy at all. So how are the photos? Well, they're pretty good. Uh, there's no doubt that the sensor is capable of some pretty great clean photos again. I wish it had optical image stabilization, but essentially this camera is a hit or miss experience. I've been taking photos with this camera for more than a week now and in just like everyday scenarios and a lot of them turn out really nice. Some of them though you'll notice turn out 
a little weird. Dynamic range is pretty much always great. Snapdragon 835 can handle taking multiple exposures at the same time, so you'd expect it to be great. And detail is pretty much always on point. The center of the frame and whatever's in focus is always sharp. Colors and image processing were pretty average. I feel like nothing was pushed too far in contrast or saturation, except maybe the reds a little bit because sometimes they got oversaturated, but otherwise it's pretty subjective whether you like the look of a photo or not. I think objectively, it'll score high on camera benchmark tests because it's very fast, very sharp, and has huge dynamic range, but side by side with the same shot from a Pixel or an iPhone, it could be a toss up, which is quite good for a phone at this price. And then there's the portrait mode from the secondary telephoto camera. Honestly, overall, this wasn't any better than the same attempts from the iPhone 7 Plus, but also not worse. Uh, it kind of struggles with complex edges, but for the most part, it does a good job blurring backgrounds. Obviously, it does a much better job on humans than it does on less predictable, less portraity subjects, and it still has some weird halo effects near the edges, but just overall, it doesn't quite match having a naturally shallow depth of field, obviously. So if you're into it, you can use it. I think it'll get better with time with software updates like Apple's has. You know, Apple's was awful when it first came out and was in beta, but it's learned and it's gotten better over time with portraits, and I think this one will too. But right now, it's right in line with what we've already seen, so nothing super new here. Also, you might be wondering why the secondary telephoto sensor with the worst aperture gets the 20 megapixel sensor while the primary gets the 16 megapixel. But their logic for that is pretty simple. It's that when you're doing all that zooming and you go way zoomed in, you're using all the data from the telephoto sensor, so you want it to be a higher resolution, so it makes sense. So beyond the design and the camera and the specs, a couple more minor things are new, and a lot of the rest is the same stuff we've seen from previous OnePlus phones. It's great stuff, but it's the same stuff. So battery here is 3,300 milliamp hours, so not bigger. It's actually 100 milliamp hours smaller than the 3T but the battery life is about the same. It lasts comfortably all day thanks to the chip and the display. And that display, that 1080p AMOLED display, this is probably the thing that's gonna get looked at as the biggest downside of a phone when you compare it to the more expensive flagships. But those are all the phones that enthusiasts are also considering buying, so you kind of have to note, those all have 1440p displays or higher, so it's really easy to say, oh, this is 1080p, it must be awful. But I'd always challenge those people to really look at the display and tell if it really does look that much worse. I mean, when I first got it, first took it out the box when it was brand new, didn't even look at the spec sheet and tried to just look at it and tell if I could see if it's a 1080p display or did they finally move to 1440p? And it took me more than just a glance. So it's a pretty good display, it gets bright enough, has pitch black blacks from being an AMOLED, etc. It's good. And then of course that 1080p display also means performance is A+. A Snapdragon 835 with the Adreno 540 and eight gigs of RAM, of course, all pushing near stock Android on a 1080p display it better not hiccup. And this thing flies through Android and that's its biggest asset, I think, super smooth performance. Tons of apps stay in memory for a long time, haven't had any memory leak issues, and that's credit to OnePlus keeping the same software philosophy again, near stock Android with a couple of improvements. No skin really, no big overlay, just a couple tweaks thrown in here and there in the settings that they believe will improve the experience. So you can do things like switch between the off-screen or on-screen buttons again with OnePlus 5. You can still mess with the shelf to the left of the home screen by adding widgets to it or messing with the built-in widgets that OnePlus includes, or you can disable it completely, your call. And there's also now a gaming do not disturb mode, which halts all banner notifications from popping up when certain apps like games are open. Uh, the camera app now has a pro mode, which lets you go full on with manual mode for everything, you know, aperture, focus distance, white balance, ISO, etc. cetera. Uh, and it shoots raw, and it even has the level and a live histogram for exposure. The extended screenshot mode is pretty cool. Uh, you start the extended screenshot mode, and it literally starts scrolling infinitely until you tell it to stop, and then that's where the screenshot ends. It's pretty intuitive, and it's just kind of fun to watch. It's well done. Dash charging is still awesome, so if you're a super heavy user and you get through this whole thing in a day, it recharges as fast as any other smartphone out there. Uh, Bluetooth 5.0 is on board. NFC is not skipped this time. The vibration motor is a lot stronger and louder and more noticeable, so if you're into that, that's important. And the microphones are also improved now too, so for recording video in super loud environments, these will do better. So is the OnePlus 5 worth your money? Well, if you can get over the design, if you're not one of those people who just wants to say it looks like an iPhone, if you can get over that, then yeah, this is definitely a great phone. There's not a whole lot that you can get with a Snapdragon 835 and eight gigs of RAM and near stock Android. So if you can get over the design and not having an infinity display, I think this is gonna be a great phone for the money and I'll give it a thumbs up. Don't get one if you can, I think you'll enjoy it. 
that's pretty much it. Thank you for watching. I'll talk to you guys in the next one. Peace.